We are now starting the second part of unit 17 of mathematical signal processing, mathematical methods of signal processing. Um, and we have seen that we have a big uh, world of um, mild distributions and that uh, this was the last step. The periodic and discrete measures can be viewed as really Dirac combs which are going on forever in a periodic manner. And that could be even in two or three dimensional space. And that would have a Fourier transform and that would be another periodic and discrete measure. The interesting thing is um, if you think of um, sampling or so, that periodicity, if it's very big, it's almost like no periodicity which is like on, this, on the free transform side, sampling the free transform very narrowly, very precisely. On the other hand, to capture local information, you would sample very densely, which means that you periodize uh, on the free transform side very coarsely. And so we will benefit of, of this idea and intuition and make it more precise. Before this, I would like to show you uh, a kind of very simple but also very useful consequence of the invariance of the Dirac comp under the extended Fourier transform, or as we have seen it, the validity of Passos formula for the for the setting of S zero. So for every function in S zero, if you give me any lattice, you can sample the function and you add all these values, or you can go to the Fourier transform domain you look at the dual or orthogonal lattice, uh, and then you sum the free transform and everything is uh, fine. Now, uh, if you give me a function and we have seen that uh, these bupus piecewise triangle, the triangular function or higher order cubic splines, they're all in this zero. Uh, the question is, how can you recognize whether a function uh, produces a bupu, and I'm doing the one dimensional case for simplicity, but you can do it multi dimensional in the same way. Uh, and then the answer is it's a bupu uh, or a partition of unity, actually, and it doesn't even have bounded support. You could do even something like a modified version of the Gauss function if and only if the free transform is a Lagrange interpolator. So, what does it mean? It means it's uh, has a Fourier transform, which is a continuous function. It's an L1 function, so it's zero even, which is one at the origin and zero at all the other lattice points. Now, uh, since we can use freely the Dirac comp, uh, the uh, proof is really easy. What does it mean that a function is creating a partition of unity? It means up that if you periodize a function, and what does it mean to periodize? To add all the translates of the function um, over the whole lattice point. Now, this is really the same as convolving the function psi with the Dirac comp. Why? Because this is sum of delta k, and delta k convolved with psi k is just uh, the shifted version of psi k. Now you can ask yourself, is this well defined on the left hand side? And I would say, yes, of course, because either you are convolving a continuous functional with a function from the test space. So you would say, oh, I have to just do this, take the Dirac comp, apply it to get the value of this resulting function at a point y, apply it to a flipped version of psi and then shift by y. Or you can say, no, we know already that bounded measures act on a zero prime. So this is an L1 function, it's bounded in this. Or you can do it in a pointwise manner. You're saying, well, I'm watching whether these sums accumulate and then you would get uniform convergence because we are in the Wiener algebra. You have atoms, they are uh, adding up in this way very nicely and then you add over all the atoms. So all these different interpretations are um, giving the same object and this claim is, it is a partition of unity if this is constant one. Now clearly this relationship, and now we are really free to do all the things that we would like to do, is going into the same, uh, is equivalent to the corresponding statement on the Fourier transform side. 
So I'm switching sides. The Fourier transform of constant one is delta zero. Well, we have seen the inverse Fourier transform, but uh, delta is flip invariant and of course also constant one. So inverse and forward Fourier transform are the same. Now to claim that we have uh, that this is, is going into this is of course that the Fourier transform, well, maybe I'm, I'm writing the proof. Um, I'm saying that, well, this is the Fourier transform of one. One can be written as a convolution product by assumption. The Fourier transform converts convolution into pointwise multiplication. So you take each of the parts, take the Fourier transform. You can here argue that this is the the, this extended Fourier transform here is the ordinary Fourier transform, but that's no problem. Poisson's formula tells us that we can leave the head and we get Dirac comp. And that's why it's convenient to have this normalization. But what is it to multiply a Dirac comp with a function which is bounded and continuous, obviously? And it's just multiplying every Dirac measure with the amplitude of the function, which is having the name psi hat in our case. Now, psi is in a zero by assumption, and therefore psi hat in this is a zero. But this means that the upper Riemannian sums are finite. So uh, they are uh, telling us that this is an L1 sequence. So it's absolutely summable. So actually we have a bounded measure. So we have a situation that we are saying one implies that the bounded measures that we get here, which we write as psi times psi hat, equals the Dirac measure. So we have actually two representations of measures concentrated on the integers. This one is the abstract expression. It's saying the amplitude should be psi hat of k, and there are only these uh, coefficients, and it's different, these are I mean, pairwise different. And here you have a representation saying, oh, it's just one times delta at zero, and zero times all the other ones. So clearly the representation is unique. So if two discrete measures, both of them living on the integers with coefficients, even in L1 are equal, they have to be have the same coefficients. So that means one has to be the value of psi hat at k and the value zero also otherwise, which is exactly the condition 289. Now, of course, if you're uh, having this condition, so the blue identity, and you write it back. I mean, if let's say you start in the opposite direction, you would say that this is the same as the delta zero. You rewrite it in this way. So this is a bijection or a identification of two conditions. That's why this is a if and only if mm -hmm. uh, lemma. Yeah, maybe I should add that, of course, the triangular function is a good example that is adding uh, to one, the shifted triangular functions are adding up to one, and the psi hat was the sink square function. Now, we also can say that we could take the boxcar function. I mean, ideally, I would say a half open interval from minus one half to one half. And if you add up, uh, you get constant one. But if you, even if you take the closed one, you would get uh, plus two at all the integer points, but these are just individual points, they don't count. So we have to identify point functions which are equal almost everywhere. So that would be still a valid statement in the spirit of distributions. And then of course you would say, oh yes, I recognize the property of the sync function. It has exactly this interpolating property or so, but uh, now the next uh, thing that I would like to discuss, and maybe we'll spend most of the time um, for the rest of this session, with uh, explanation of the guy in the middle, the L2 space. So we have seen already in the discussion of the Poisson uh, formula of the proof that the orthogonality relationships for the pure frequencies in the space of periodic functions is a very useful thing. It allows us to expand um, an arbitrary continuous function. And this is kind of the reason why functional analysis is playing such a big role. But uh, I would like to uh, discuss now uh, the situation of L2 in more detail. So uh, I think, yeah. Uh, 
Um, I'm not sure if it's exactly the way how it should be done, but uh, we, I try to give some explanations and of how our approach allows to introduce the Hilbert space. Now, I have started to tell you uh, over and over again that Banach spaces are quite useful. Uh, so we have vector spaces, in our case, mostly infinite dimensional vector spaces. Uh, but in order to describe convergence, we need some norm. We measure the distances and we get limits. Now, sometimes it's not enough to take convergence in the sense of the norm, especially if we're in a dual space, then we might only be happy with convergence by action or what was the weak star convergence, or it's related to strong operator convergence if you are looking at operators. So recall the S0, K convolved with F, these, these um, convolution operators with the Dirac comp are approximating the identity operator whenever you apply it to a given function and so on. So the, we need more, but there is one additional structure that is very helpful uh, for, uh, for the discussion of many things. And that's the introduction of a scalar product. I've heard very often in engineering uh, explanations or books that in nature, all the signals are of finite energy and that's why it's uh, reasonable to work within the setting of the Hilbert space. Now I'm a little bit skeptic and usually watching the waves at the ocean, I'm saying, well, this is not finite energy, it's finite energy per time unit. So it's going on and on for millions of years. And therefore to say it's finite energy is a little bit um, questionable. What you can say from a mathematical point of view that in the Hilbert space, you can work as if you were in the Euclidean space. We all know what the three-dimensional um, space is doing. It's allowing you to uh, talk about subspaces like a plane to orthogonal project onto a subspace to find minimal distances and, and such things to talk about orthogonality by saying the scalar product is zero and all this can be done in any Hilbert space. So let's be, go back to RD. We will say we can introduce the scalar product already on the continuous function with compact support. So just with the help of the, of the Riemann integral, we can describe the scalar product of F with G by collecting over all the arguments. Of course, it should be F of X against g of x conjugate dx um, and it's like a continuous analog of the ordinary scalar product. It goes along with the norm, which is the two norm and the more important Cauchy-Schwarz inequality can be established in a few lines um, for any such setting using the sesquilinearity. So it's linear in the first variable and it's conjugate linear in the second. So it's respects addition, but if you pull out a lambda from the second part, you get a lambda conjugate to the outside. This is the convention of mathematicians. And I think also most engineers, whereas physicists would like to have the conjugation in the first component, but that's not our business now. Why is it so important? Well, in many places, but also because it allows you to prove triangle inequality, which is kind of not at all obvious if you just see this as a kind of scalar product. Now, uh, I would like to explain to you three different ways how to uh, generate a space, which is uh, the Hilbert space L2, which deserves the name, but I would like to give different names before we do this identification. Just think of uh, the uh, situation with uh, rational and real numbers. We all know that analysis courses very often start with the statement that while well, the rational numbers are fine, but uh, there is no rational number such that the square equals two. I'm not saying square root of two is irrational because when you start with the rationals at the moment, you don't even know what square root of two would be. So you would say, well, but I can approximate, I can get numbers which are having the property that their square is closer and closer to, to this uh, goal two. 
And then you observe that they are a Cauchy sequence. And therefore you're saying, yes, I find a Cauchy sequence of rational numbers with this property of more better and better behaving like what you would like to call square root of two. But then you have other ways of doing it, decimal expression, other number systems or so. And then you have to introduce equivalence classes. Now, the decimal system is a way to select one particular class, which is very well organized so, so that you can say one is a better approximation than another one because it has more decimals. But in general, you have to think that we are talking about the completion. So what we could do here now is you can say, well, we know what Cauchy sequences are. If you give me a sequence of continuous functions with compact support, meaning each of them has compact support, I would be able to verify if it's a Cauchy sequence or not. It would mean that if I'm able for every epsilon to find an index such that pairwise the distances in the L2 sense are small, I'm happy. And then of course I have to think that such a Cauchy sequence is representing something that might be missing. Well, and the, the task is that uh, you can have different Cauchy sequences. So you ex explain that what is an equivalence of Cauchy sequences. Well, clearly it has the same limit, means that if you mix them, you can take, uh, let's say, Fn and Gn. Um, and then if you mix them and you take just both of them with large index, you cannot mix, uh, you cannot make a, see a big difference or so. So two functions, two Cauchy sequences are equivalent if they are not distinguishable in the sense of this relationship 309 or so. And then you're saying now I give, uh, I, 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 I call the space of equivalence classes um, the elements of the Hilbert space. Now, where's the original space? kind of where are the rational numbers inside their uh, real numbers? And the answer is very easy. You can take a rational number and repeat it. So the constant sequence f, f zero, f zero, f zero, f zero is of course representing the function f. It's one possible representative for an element. And so the original space of continuous functions is embedded. Now we have to put some scalar product and actually some norm on the bigger space. And you say, well, I'm watching what I can say about the two norms of those functions. You work with this, you find out, yes, this limit exists. So these are positive numbers now, whereas the Fn themselves are in some infinite dimensional space. And then I'm using the square bracket to describe the equivalence classes. So I'm saying, well, the norm of an equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences is defined to be the limit. Of course, you have to sit down and verify that if you would choose another representative, another GM, that then uh, the limit would also exist and would be the same. So it's a well-defined norm. And then you find out that the original space is, um, is uh, contained as a dense subspace, very much like rational numbers are inside the real numbers and so on. So we, we could do this and we would have an example. Now, uh, the delicate thing about this would be, this is an abstract space, I mean, it's nice. But now if you would do the same with LP norms, so instead of taking the norm, I mean, maybe I should write it here, it's the square root of integral over F absolute squared dx. So you, very often people call the energy of a signal is the integral over f absolute squared uh, dx. And now you can take instead of the square, you can take the piece power with p between one and infinity. And then afterwards to take the piece root, you get the LP norm. Then you would have, you could play the same game in the func following a functional analysis course, you could take Cauchy sequence or so, but I mean, how would you compare all these different completions? So the kind of, they might go in completely different directions. Whereas what we are doing is we're saying, no, no, we embed everything into, uh, uh, in, uh, into the uh, space of uh, a zero prime. And uh, that's what we will do. Now, uh, I will, go back to this in a moment.
because I have to recall the definition in the Lebesgue sense. So the definition of L2 in the spirit of Lebesgue would be to say, well, F is the space of all, and I have to be a bit wordy now, all the equivalence classes of measurable functions such that this integral is finite. So of course it should be dx now. And uh, that means you should avoid completely pathological functions which are not even measurable. So so nasty that it doesn't make sense to ask for the integral, but uh, the integral of this measurable function, so kind of the problem is there are non-measurable functions such that the absolute value of f is measurable. So that's why the finiteness of this is not, not good enough. But uh, this is a technical problem that actually I try to avoid by, by explaining things as they are. Now, uh, the same definition uh, can be done with L1. So you're just taking the measurable functions where this integral dx is finite. And uh, now I would like to show that the Lebesgue theory uh, coincides with the, or, or gives you the same uh, spaces as the one that we have here. And um, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. I have to explain that the standard way of equivalence classes, which is different now for Lebesgue theory, it's saying that two elements in either L1 or in L2 are representing the same function function under quotation marks, if they're equal almost everywhere. And that this is the same as defining functionals which are uh, defined on a zero and with the property such that uh, they are equal for every function f in a zero. So two functions are equal in the sense of Lebesgue integration theory, meaning they're equal almost everywhere, if and only if their action you let them act g acts by integration on the f, h acts by integration on f, and everything is fine. Now I'm saying the g and the h can be either in L1 or in L2, or be a sum of two such things. So just to look at one of these things, if g is in L1, it's clear that uh, an L1 function multiplied with a bounded continuous function stays integrable. If you give me an L2 function g, I would argue that Cauchy-Schwarz is applicable. The product of two measurable functions is, I mean, a continuous function is measurable. Therefore, it's a product of measurable functions is measurable. And it's integrable according to Cauchy-Schwarz because this is square integrable, obviously. And this is square integrable by assumption. Therefore, the integral exists. So uh, I'm saying that this is true. And uh, actually, I'm not giving a proof because in order to do it, I would have to dive into uh, measure theory. Now, let me see. I think I put the definition earlier. No. Or maybe I'm okay. oh, sorry for this. Yeah, so maybe, uh, yeah. Maybe um, the next step would be to say, well, if I would, uh, as, as mathematicians would start to describe the whole theory, if I would start with L2, why is L2, I mean, our, my yellow circle inside the big uh, space of mild distributions? And uh, the argument is simply because we have Cauchy Schwartz. But let's do it in detail. So I'm saying, the L2 in the spirit of Lebesgue can be viewed as subspace of a zero prime. And uh, you see here what I was doing is, uh, if you're taking uh, the L2 norm squared, is this integral, and because we know that a function in a zero is both in the Wiener algebra, therefore integrable, and also in C0, so we can split this into an integral over absolute value of x and we pull out the maximum. Now both the L1 norm and the sup norm, which is the norm for C0, can be controlled by some constant. I mean, for simplicity, I took the same constant and therefore we have f twice is C squared times f as zero 
Uh, actually, it should be F0 squared, of course. So I have to do a correction on this here. And uh, then um, if you have this estimate, of course, you take the square root and you get that two norm of F is controlled by, by the square norm or, uh, yeah, I think that, yeah, that, that's what we have to do. So this is the embedding, so sorry. So the first part of the proof tells us, us that the small red uh, magenta circle is inside the yellow object. Uh, so maybe I'm going back to, to my picture. Yeah, so we have two arguments. We have a little bit discussed the yellow domain and we say it's nice because it's a Hilbert space unlike uh, the other spaces. But first argument was this guy is inside the yellow and now the next one will be the yellow is inside the big uh, area. So we go back to this proof. So we have done this and now the second part is we say, well, if you give me an L2 function, we define a functional. And how would we define a functional? Well, in the usual way, we let it act by integration. And now, because we are in the world of Lebesgue integrals, we would say, yes, this integral exists. We can even estimate the absolute value of the, of the integral by the integral over the absolute values. But this can be estimated by the cauchy schwarz inequality by the L2 product of G with F L2. But we have control on the F by the S0 norm. That means the output of such a linear functional, which is well-defined. It's a finite uh, value, complex number for any um, uh, F in a S0. But that number can be controlled by its size, by something which is a constant. And you see it's the L2 norm of the generating element from L2 up to some constant times the size of the input, which is the F. So we have to see how F goes to sigma G of F and we can control it by some constant times this. And therefore we can say yes, the functional or this element viewed as an element of the big space can be controlled in its norm by the same constant times the alternum of the G. So in this way we have uh, a situation that we really have a triple of spaces and this will be discussed in great detail further on. I call it a Banach, Gelfand triple, clearly because we have um, a Banach spaces, three Banach spaces, but they're in very specific manner. They are such that the Hilbert space is a guy in the middle and there is a small Banach space, our space of test function, and uh, the Hilbert space is what I call sandwiched between a zero and a zero prime. Actually, we even know that there's an embedding uh, from a zero into a zero prime, so it's weak star dense. And we could also prove that a zero is a dense subspace here. So yes, it's not density of L2 in the norm sense, but we have density in the big space, it's density in the weak star sense, other also a serious weak star dance and there's density in the norm sense from the Hilbert space. So we will see that our Fourier transform actually respects all the three levels. We have seen with some work, it's respecting a zero. We have seen plus rel, we have it here at this level and we have uh, by duality, the extended Fourier transform, which leaves this. So the traditional approach would be to prove first in mathematical approach, first proof Lebesgue by Lebesgue integration plus R theorem, then establish a zero as a subspace and then extend it further by duality. We have more or less tried to go directly for a zero invariance, extend the Fourier transform directly to a zero prime and find that the L2 space is something in between. But uh, okay, so this is now, okay. now. This is maybe uh, a little bit uh, abstract, even more abstract than some other things that we have done. Um, but uh, if you would like to get uh, 
uh, L2 without, I mean, just from Riemann integration, without Lebesgue integration, without this abstract uh, completion trick with the Cauchy sequencer. So I would say, well, how can I get the signals with finite energy inside a zero prime? And I would say, well, take just ordinary functions in a zero and take weak star limits. So limit, I, I should write for n to in, from one to infinity in the weak star sense, but assume that they are Cauchy sequence. So CS stands for Cauchy sequences. So it's kind of a mixture. Instead of talking about equivalence classes, I'm saying it should be Cauchy sequence in, uh, um, in well, you have to read it carefully, in a zero, but with respect to the L2 norm. So you have to read it carefully in the sense that each Fn is a decent function, but the Cauchy condition, of course, is not in the norm of a zero, but in the more loose norm, L2 norm. So we have seen a zero is embedded into L2, even if you do it, I mean, L2 norm is a little bit more loose. So you might have Cauchy sequences, which are not convergent in a zero. That's the point. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to increase it. If you would take Cauchy sequence in a zero only, you would get only a zero element. So this is because uh, a zero is a Banach space. So now, um, first of all, we have to discuss this a little bit. And then we would like to say, well, but how can you define the norm of such an element? And so it's kind of, this is our L2 space defined as a space of mild distribution. And I would say, well, take the limit of the norms of the approximating things. And again, you have the problem that somebody else may take another sequence and that for any such sequence, you would get the same limit. I didn't do the details of this. So for a moment, I will call this version of L2 the uh, uh, SOP, the, so, so the CRS zero prime version of uh, L2, um, but we will see in a moment that they are all equal. So the claim is uh, just a bold claim. The L2 space in, defined in this particular way as the subspace of a zero prime, obviously, is, uh, well, continuously embedded into the, in the, into the uh, a zero prime. So we, it's actually a normed space, it's a complete space, but it's isometric, isomorphic to either the abstract definition, and the abstract definition is known to be isomorphic to L2. So it's just three different ways of realizing the same Hilbert space. And uh, as we will see, the advantage, of course, is that we will do uh, with work with the uh, with the um, uh, concrete objects uh, in, a, in a way. So I will, uh, so the point of my theorem is that even if we do introduce L2 in a fancy way, we get exactly something which from the point of view of an Hilbert space is completely indistinguishable um, from, from the uh, well-known object and uh, called L2. And therefore, uh, once we have clarified the content of theorem 16, as it is now, we will just talk about the Hilbert space L2. So uh, the first one is, well, if somebody is giving you such a Cauchy sequence and you apply it, uh, why do you get a, a functional which is, uh, um, which is uh, in a zero prime? Now, the first thing is, of course, you can say, well, the action is quite clear. My Fn are acting as functionals. So they are introducing by integration against Fn. You, you use Cauchy-Schwarz, the sigma Fn of F. Again, this is integral F of X, Fn of X, dx. Is, must be convergent. That's a consequence of the Cauchy condition. So you just define the functional uh, as element of a zero prime, which is well defined for every f uh, on this. But now we have to be careful. Is it not just a linear functional, maybe a pathological one, but is it bounded? And that's where you need a principle from functional analysis. If you have a sequence of linear functionals, which for every f is convergent, and we can 
do this by Cauchy Schwarz, then they have to be uniformly bounded. So they, uh, these FNs have to be uniformly bounded. Or we use the proof that we had before that the L2 now with Riemann integral is embedded into a zero prime. So that's, that's what you can do. So you get either by direct argument or by an abstract argument that the limit can be controlled, meaning that the size of the output is a functional complex number can be controlled by the size of the input, which is F up to some constant. I should write maybe C sub sigma because of course each new class of Cauchy sequences gives you a constant which is controlling the behavior of the limiting functional, but uh, that's kind of the problem. Also, uh, you should keep in mind that when you want to define a norm, uh, you have to observe two things. I uh, didn't do all the details. One is that it's really a, a convergent. So is the limit of the norms existing? We know, know that two different elements are, are, are close to each other. So the difference between Fn and Fm in the Alturum will be small. That's just uh, the Cauchy condition. But what can you say about this? And this is sometimes called the reverse triangular inequality. So roughly speaking, you can estimate Fn by saying, okay, Fn is just Fm minus the difference. But you can also estimate Fm by saying, okay, Fm is Fm plus the difference. Now the opposite order, but the size of the difference is not changing if you change uh, the order. So the L2 norm of Fn minus Fm is the same as the L2 norm of Fm minus Fm. That's why you can say, you can squeeze the difference, positive and negative possibilities by this. Now, this is a Cauchy sequence. Therefore, this has to be a Cauchy sequence of in the Hilbert space, but that means that the absurd, the norms are Cauchy sequence in the positive real numbers. So the limit exists. Of course, then you go on and prove that it's independent of the representing uh, functional and so on. Now, uh, I leave it a little bit, uh, um, the details because it's, you can say it's a cumbersome and, and, and a fancy way of you of introducing L2, but you would like to know, is it a Hilbert space? So you need, is it a complete space with respect to this norm? So the argument will be, if somebody is giving you a sequence sigma K, which is absolutely convergent, which means this sum is finite. And then you would like to know, well, can they represent it also in this particular way? And so of course the, the trick would be, well, you can get such an estimate up to some epsilon. So you would say, I'm representing uh, the sigma one, the sigma two and so on as a Cauchy sequence. And then you are adding up the Cauchy sequence. So I don't know, let's say you have the first five sigma K. And then if you want to have a partial sum, you would say, well, for the first sigma, the second, the third and so on, there is a sequence labeled maybe F upper one lower n or upper five lower n. And then you add up all the Cauchy sequence which have a label with number five. The one belonging to sigma one, sigma two and so on. And you have to verify that this is still a Cauchy sequence and, and so on. So this is a little bit cumbersome, but not, not too difficult. Now, uh, in order to be able to identify uh, the L2 as we defined it now, so I'm claiming now after some work, uh, we have uh, an argument that we have a Hilbert space, a complete space, with a scalar product even defined in a natural way. Now we would like to say that each such Cauchy sequence is also defining an element from the Lebesgue space or so. And that's quite clear because a two by Lebesgue integration theory is a complete space known to be contain the continuous function with compact support as a dense subspace. And uh, so the only thing is, is it true that a zero is also a dense subspace? So what is the difference between continuous function with compact support and a zero? Well, here the functions have to be in the free algebra, whereas otherwise 
And so the trick is you are taking a function f uh, uh, and then you, the main point is you're uh, convolving it with a, with a nice function which is in the zero. So then uh, you're, you're saying, well, my function f, which is in L2, might not be L1. So we have to damp it a little bit. Maybe you multiply it with a very wide triangular function. So then we get a product of two L2 function, which is an L1 function. And then we do a convolution with a very compressed, maybe again, triangular function, which is in a zero. So these things, according to Lebesgue integration theory, approximate the function f in L2. But according to our knowledge about a zero, this is an L1, this is an S0, the convolution product is in S0. So we can show that uh, the convolution, the, these expressions allow to approximate any L2 function. So we can say, well, by the abstract argument with the completion, S0 with the L2 norm has a completion, which in the spirit of Lebesgue integration will be L2 Lebesgue. And in the spirit of our approach is just the SOP version, and that's how we can get uh, this thing. I don't think it's uh, uh, very uh, reasonable to even bother you with too, with many more technical details. Just let's say, in this way, we have established a Hilbert space that are it's my yellow object, which is uh, also the domain for the Plusher theorem, and it's squeezed in between a zero and a zero prime with a dense embedding here and weak star density of a zero in the big space. So we can move now in our world where we have the discrete measures, the periodic measures, the nice functions, the bounded continuous function, and we kind of are living in this world now. So, uh, uh, I would like to mention that on this page on the Newark website, you can find a lot of uh, talks on the subject, but it's not so important. Now, uh, maybe at the end of this session, let me remind you, it's more uh, to tell you that uh, I have written down uh, uh, details of the equivalence between the discrete and the continuous norm, and I will use it in, in the next uh, unit. Um, and I would only try to give you an idea. So what was the idea? One can take instead of the partition of unity characterization uh, of a zero, we can do the continuous norm description. So maybe this is another way to understand a zero. So I'm saying, if you give me any L1 function, and you take a controlling localizer. So that's maybe you think of the triangular function. Maybe you think of a well, the Gauss function is not formally correct. I mean, it doesn't fit to, to my restriction at the beginning, but it's almost like this. But maybe you take a trapezoidal function. It's a sum of a few triangular function. Then you're saying, well, what I want to do in a continuous fashion for a variable set that can be in RD. So you're moving with your uh, and watching glass over the picture, uh, magnify and concentrate on the pieces or you do it on the real line. So you move your trapezoidal function very much like you get your short time free transform and that's what we will do actually. And you're measuring the FL1 norm. Well, what does it mean? Maybe you'd start from a continuous bounded function uh, and then your F then you multiply it with the trapezoidal function centered at set. So you get a continuous function with compact support. What does it mean to take the FL1 norm? Just say, well, I hope that this guy has an integrable Fourier transform, which means that we are in the situation that you have an L1 function, which has an integrable Fourier transform. So the local piece can be recovered by the inversion Fourier theorem from the Fourier transform of this. But we take as a norm, as a size of this, we say it's kind of very, very small here. It's very quiet. It's small L1, FL1 norm, or you take a big one norm. Now the claim is, if you give me any function in the F, in the Fourier algebra or a bounded continuous function, where this integral over the variable or over all the positions and I call this kappa the control function 
a controlled function f, the signal f, which is maybe long and ongoing with the help of the window trapezoidal function localizer, sorry, and I measure in the A norm, for us A equals Fourier norm, Fourier algebra norm is important, defines an equivalent norm on the object that we have already introduced earlier, which is the amalgam space. You take the absolute convergence sums with the help of some bupu. And of course, it looks like a norm and it is a norm. So if this is fine that you're in this space, uh, a, a little l1, and the norms are equivalent. Now the proof is kind of technical, but at the same time, uh, uh, <clears throat> I can try to explain the, the key idea or so. And it's all about uh, the geometry of where are the functions, I mean, which part do you measure when you look at the control function? And clearly you have to look at the part of F which is inside the support of the shifted trapezoidal function. So maybe we, we think of something concrete. The trapezoidal function is concentrated on minus three plus three. If z equals 100, this is at 97 to 103. Well, there are a few lattice points nearby. And if you know, to, if you want to control this, you only have to compare it to these lattice points. So this is really what we have to do. The support is something around set K. So it has some support and you can say, well, it's everything is happening around this. And if you take the pupu, you need only to sum up about a finite set of elements which are nearby. So the trick is to say, well, I can, uh, yeah, I'm also using that the trapezoidal function are uh, having a norm which is equal independent of the position. Recall that shifting a function means multiplying with a pure frequency in the free domain, and that doesn't change the L1 norm. So this is quite clear. Okay, so the trick is to say, well, uh, the control function is, uh, if you take the integral over a part of the unit cube, so in 1D it would be from uh, K to K plus one, is just uh, something where you have the t set k, but I'm summing up over the finitely many elements from the bupu which are relevant. So I make another larger plateau function, which I can put at the center of the point and I can control this. So I make sure that this capital phi, it's a partial sum, it's a function which is even larger than the little phi, and so you can produce it. So now I have a triple product and I can pull out the norm of this guy here, but because it has the same norm as it shifted, it will pull out some constant times this here. But this is for every fixed case. So I'm focusing on the part of the integral of the control function over the cube near K. And if you sum over all the K, of course you get the sum over all the Ks, but that's just um, a constant times, okay, there is of course something missing. Uh, these are the building blocks which we have here. Yeah, so this, this term, sorry, should be a finite sum that tells you how many building blocks are involved uh, times the norm of those original pieces in the, in the, in the norm. Maybe I should uh, only mention that in the opposite direction, we can also uh, do the same thing. We play around with the, with the uh, uh, yeah, maybe I should say, we, we use the following simple fact that if you replace your window by a shifted window, then you get, uh, uh, so shifting the window means shifting the control function. Now, this means that if you replace a window by a shifted window, you can get the same finite expression. So we know that this is finite, but we know we could take the same bump function also here. And now the trick is to say, well, but if we do 20 linear combinations, 20 versions of the shifted function, we can build a, even a plateau function. So we take finite linear combinations, then we integrate it and we make sure that this function phi is replaced by a plateau function. And so we can say, if you convolve the phi with a plateau function, 
We can control it by some L1 norm of the convolved P times this. And then we use uh, the, uh, the fact, uh, maybe I, that's too long, the fact that we can estimate now the discrete sum by the continuous integral because we are free to go away from the fixed phi to many other functions phi. And if we choose P properly, uh, that one can be used to control this thing. Also see there are still some typos in the text, but uh, I would like to rather use this equivalence norm um, and uh, mention at the last statement that if we uh, look at the proof, we can even take any function in the space. So even non-compactly supported like the Gauss function and we do the continuous control function with respect to the Gauss function. And that will be a very useful uh, way to look at a zero. So um, maybe this could be a starting point for the next uh, unit um, so that we can say, well, what if we take a continuous norm with respect to Gaussian window? That's just another way of describing the same space, but it's actually the way how it's described or introduced uh, uh, in the book of Karl-Heinz Grochenig in the book on time frequency analysis. I thank you for your attention and 